So this screencast on molecular orbitals follows on from the previous video on atomic orbitals and hybridization, and like that video, it's relevant for our first year organic chemistry module. So in the previous video, we saw atomic orbitals, mainly S and P orbitals, and we looked at the different shapes and electron distributions in these orbitals. But one of the things that we noted was that all of these orbitals can exist as two different phases, depending on the phase of their radial distribution function, which I've denoted in these videos as being shaded or unshaded. Now in this video, we're going to see why the phase is important. Um, but we also went a step further in the previous video, and we said that when bonding to atoms like carbon, we're not usually bonding to unhybridized orbitals like uh, an S orbital. We're bonding to hybridized atomic orbitals, and we saw how atoms like carbon can mix their orbitals together to form sp3, sp2, or sp hybridized orbitals, which are shown here in green. And this gives us our uh, relevant molecular geometries. So tetrahedral in the case of sp3, trigonal planar as sp2, and linear as sp. Now, if we've got sp2 or sp hybridized atoms, we've also got a number of unhybridized p orbitals left over. And these are shown in red here. So we've either got one or two p orbitals. And we'll be using those in this video later on. So in the previous video, we were just dealing with atomic orbitals, so the orbitals on an individual atom. But now what we're going to do is form molecular orbitals. So we're going to bring multiple atoms together and we're going to overlap their orbitals with each other to form new orbitals. So if we bring these two atoms together, they've both just got an S orbital for simplicity, then their orbitals can overlap and sort of mix together. So we can form molecular orbitals. Now, molecular orbitals are shared between the atoms, so sharing orbitals across multiple atoms allows us to make and break chemical bonds. So this is going to be really important for building up the structure of organic molecules. Now, this is where the phase of the orbital becomes important. Again, sticking just with the S orbitals, um, just for simplicity, but we'll do some more examples later. If we mix uh, two atomic orbitals in phase, so the phase of them matches. So either we have shaded orbital and shaded orbital, or these could both be unshaded. The phase has to match. If we mix them in phase, we get constructive overlap. So if you think about it mathematically, the two equations um, constructively interact with each other, so you end up with a stronger interaction. So that would look something like this. We would end up with our orbital density in between the two atoms, and this is what we call a bonding molecular orbital. So filling bonding molecular orbitals with electrons makes chemical bonds. On the other hand, if we mix our atomic orbitals out of phase, so one of them is unshaded and one of them is shaded, or vice versa, then we get destructive overlap. So mathematically speaking, the two equations kind of cancel each other out. So if we bring these atoms together, the orbital density now is outside of what we call the internuclear distance, or the gap between the two atoms. Um, you can kind of think of it like magnets, if you like, repelling each other. They basically don't want to get near each other. So this is destructive overlap. And this gives us what we call antibonding molecular orbitals. Now, filling antibonding molecular orbitals with electrons breaks chemical bonds. So we're going to come on to this in later videos in terms of chemical reactivity. Now, the orientation of the orbitals is also important. So I've changed the orbitals here. We're not using S orbitals anymore. We're now using sp3 and sp2 atomic orbitals. Um, the directionality of these orbitals is important. So if the orbitals are pointing directly at each other, as these ones are, then we get what, what I've called end-on overlap. So if we bring these orbitals together, we form a new orbital um, in the middle of these two atoms. And end-on overlap gives us what we call a sigma orbital, or a sigma star if it's antibonding, but we'll see that in a moment. So basically, all of your orbital density is in the internuclear distance, and it's directly between the two atoms. So what happens if we have destructive end-on overlap? Well, if we bring these two atoms together, the orbitals cancel each other out, they don't want to get near each other. So we end up with a sigma antibonding molecular orbital, and we've put a little star on this to denote that it's antibonding. So any antibonding orbital um, is, has got a star designation. So this is a sigma star antibonding molecular orbital. So constructive end-on overlap gives us sigma bonding. 
destructive endon overlap gives a sigma star antibonding. And just to give you an example, um, I've just put an S orbital here rather than a hybridized orbital, just to show that it works exactly the same way. We've got an S orbital, which is obviously spherical. This counts as endon overlap because it's pointing directly at the, the other atom. So we get constructive endon overlap, which is a sigma bonding molecular orbital. Now, if the orbitals are parallel, but at 90 degrees to the internuclear distance, so in this case, we've got two unhybridized p-atomic orbitals, you can see that their lobes are not pointing directly at each other. They are at 90 degrees, but parallel. Then we get a different type of bonding or antibonding. So in this case, we've got side on overlap. So if we bring these two orbitals together, you can see now this is a constructive interaction because the phases were matching. But we now get all of our orbital density kind of above and below uh, because we've mixed these two p orbitals together. So this 90 degree side on overlap gives us what we call a pi orbital. And in this case, because it's constructive overlap, it's a pi bonding molecular orbital. So if we take uh, our p orbitals back again, and we just flip the phase of one of them so that now it's destructive, right? So this, this one's shaded, this lobe is unshaded, this lobe's shaded, and this lobe's unshaded. So this is going to be destructive overlap. These two come together. The orbitals don't want to get near each other. So this is a pi star, again, that star designation here, antibonding molecular orbital. So those are basically our four options. We can have sigma bonding, sigma star antibonding. Those are caused by endon overlap. And we can have pi bonding and pi star antibonding, and they're caused by sidon overlap. So a quick rule of thumb, if you're not sure about a molecular orbital, whether it's sigma or pi, uh, look at it end on, so down the internuclear distance. So if you imagine looking at this orbital here, um, kind of in the plane of the screen, looking down the internuclear distance between the two atoms, if it looks circular or spherical, if you like, it's a sigma orbital. And if you look down this one, down here, if it looks like a figure of eight or a dumbbell, it's a pi orbital. So that's a quick and easy way of telling whether you've got a sigma or a pi orbital. Now, if we go back to our hybridization modes that we saw previously, um, we said that these uh, hybridizations, sp3, sp2, and sp, mapped onto our molecular geometries. And we can now kind of see why that is. So if we're dealing with sp3 hybridization, um, we've basically got all of our sp3 orbitals pointed directly at one of the substituent atoms that's attached to this carbon. So because these orbitals here, this sp3 orbital and whatever orbital is on this red atom, are pointing directly at each other, we get a sigma bond between these two uh, atoms. And the same is true of all the other substituents. So we end up with four sigma bonds, and that is saturated, sp3 hybridized tetrahedral carbon. If we do the same with our sp2 hybridized carbon, now our sigma bonds are pointing at the three substituents again, right? This is end on overlap. So we're, we're forming sigma bonding and sigma star antibonding orbitals um, between these the, the carbon atom and these red atoms here. So that's why we get a trigonal planar arrangement. But now we've got this p orbital, which is at 90 degrees to all of these three substituents. So this now, this p orbital will undergo side on overlap with one of those. So we can form a pi bond to one of these atoms and it's drawn as this atom over here. So we've got sigma orbitals and pi orbitals possible on an sp2 hybridized uh, atom. Now the same is true of sp hybridization. We just got two sigma bonds now and we can form two pi bonds um, to either of the atoms. So you can either have a triple bonded carbon in this direction, or you can have kind of double double bonded carbon, if you like, where you've got a double bond here and a double bond there. So the point is, sp3 hybridization gives you four sigma bonds and a tetrahedral geometry. sp2 hybridization gives you three sigma bonds and one pi bonds and a uh, trigonal planar geometry. And sp hybridization gives you two sigma bonds and two pi bonds and a linear geometry. And we'll see in the following videos how we can use these to build up the structure of organic molecules and in later videos how we can uh, interpret chemical reactions and predict chemical reactions using these orbitals.